Dr. Dinesh Ni is a senior lecturer, Human Genetics Unit, Faculty of Medicine, Colombo. Over to you, Dr. Dinesh Ni. Thank you, Dr. Thilina. Today, my presentation is on how to uh, approach the diagnosis of a dysmorphic child. So in a clinical setting, especially if uh, you are a pediatrician or if you're uh, seeing the children for the first time, this is a very important aspect that we need to consider. So when we uh, look at the today's lecture, there are a few things that we will be covering. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you'll be able to identify common dysmorphic features that are encountered. And when to suspect a genetic etiology when you see somebody with a dysmorphic feature. And also to know the approach to diagnosing a dysmorphic child. And finally, to understand the basis of genetic testing. Uh, so just an introduction into dysmorphology. So dysmorphology is a branch of clinical genetics in which clinicians and researchers study, the, study and attempt to interpret the pattern of human growth and structural defects. So the term dysmorphology originates from the Greek term dys, meaning disorder, and morph, meaning shape or form. So in the world, when we look at uh, all the live births, we find about one in 40 children, or one in 40 neonates have a small dysmorphology. But they might not always be very significant. So in that context, about 2.5% of all newborns have a birth malformation. So this may be an isolated malformation, or it may be a feature of a syndromic malformation. So right now, currently, there are about 4,000 4, malformation syndromes that have been identified and documented. So the most uh, syndromes occur due to certain etiology or certain causes. About 90% of the dysmorphology uh, features that you will encounter could be due to genetic causes. And genetic causes also can be divided into single gene disorders, which are monogenic disorders. For example, Alpert syndrome or neurofibromatosis, right? And uh, there can be chromosomal disorders. As my colleagues have uh, previously described, there's Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, Edwards syndrome. So those are chromosomal disorders. Then you can have microdeletion syndrome, such as prader willi syndrome. So as I said, there can be monogenic disorders, there can be polygenic disorders, where more than one gene can affect the uh, outcome of the syndrome, such, such as club foot. So these have monoge a polygenic inheritance, pa inheritance pattern. So there can be uh, factors that are not genetic. This could be uh, environmental causes. These are called teratogenesis, such as rubella, congenital viral infections, and mothers who have uh, diabetes, and the mothers who have used teratogenic drugs. So these, all of these uh, scenarios can lead to certain dysmorphic features in a newborn. So how, uh, when will you suspect if a child has a, a genetic etiology, if the child presents with a dysmorphic feature. So congenital anomalies, if you look at congenital anomalies, we will usually say one or more major anomaly or more than two minor anomalies. So if the child has one or more major anomaly or more than two minor anomalies, we have to suspect a genetic diagnosis. Then poor growth. In the intrauterine life, if there are symmetrical intrauterine growth restriction, or in the postnatal life, there is growth failure. Then there could be developmental delays or developmental regression. That is, a child can de develop the certain uh, all the milestones and then suddenly can experience developmental regression. Then there could be craniofacial dysmorphism. So these are very commonly identified dysmorphisms, which are the craniofacial anomalies. And the other very commonly encountered dysmorphic features we find in our clinic is the ambiguous genitalia. So when you have a child, when, uh, as a clinician, what is the approach that you should follow to make the accurate diagnosis? 
So the history is very important. So you need to take a good history of the perinatal details, especially if the mother was on any drugs or any uh, other uh, illness, especially viral illness, all that needs to be documented. And family history of any congenital problems and genetic disorders need to be documented. Then is the physical examination. So physical examination it has to be very detailed. You need to look at whether there are minor or major anomalies, right? And uh, if you can uh, measure the growth and the measurements also need to be documented. So this can be done by your previous records and even photographs because usually when a dysmorphic feature is present, it is present at birth, but the feature can evolve as the child grows. So having photographic evidence it helps us to look at how this feature is evolving. Then you can make a diagnosis based on the above data. So this have, you have to remember now this is going to be a clinical diagnosis. So this can be done by syndromic searches. So there are databases where when you type the feature, they might give you certain differential diagnosis. But again, you have to remember uh, certain dysmorphic features are non-specific. For example, if you have a child who has, a, for example, a male child who is short stature and um, probably uh, with uh, uh, hyperterrorism, right? So these are very uh, non-specific dysmorphic features and you will have a lot of differential diagnosis. Whereas if there is a, a syndrome, uh, for example, syndictyly, where there's fusion of uh, the fingers. So these are quite specific. So to narrow down, uh, you have to have a broad idea of what these uh, features results in, which syndrome these features results in. Right? So uh, you have to document the key anomalies noted in the baby. So this can also be complemented with certain investigations, especially ultrasound scans, then blood tests, uh, hormonal studies, and organ systems, especially echograms and uh, other liver function tests. These, all these tests can complement all your clinical data. Then finally, and the most important thing is to get a genetic confirmation. This is when the actual diagnosis is made. So clinical suspicion is made by most of the clinicians when they refer the patients to us. And then we do the confirmation or the confirmatory genetic testing accompanied with counseling. Proper counseling is also very important because these patients need to be followed up, especially if there are syndromic patients. So these are some of the uh, commonly associated craniofacial dysmorphology. Right? So there are certain variations. Some variations are normal. That is, it's a, it's a uh, spectrum. If you say the normal features, if you take it as a spectrum, these are normal variations. Then there can be minor anomalies and major anomalies. So uh, most uh, common ones are the microcephaly. Okay, so you can have a, sm a small head and also flat forehead. Then epicanthal folds, low nasal bridge, then minor ear anomalies can be there, short nose, micrognathia, uh, thin lips, then indistinct uh, philtrum, and uh, flat mid face. Okay, so these are uh, some of the common uh, morphological changes. So these morphological changes can also give us an idea as to the morphogenesis and clues of malformations that might be present in the child, in the other organ systems. Now, <clears throat> looking at some of the clinical pictures, you can see in this child, there is uh, somewhat of a large tongue, right? And also there's a flat nasal bridge. And uh, in this, you have ear, uh, ear deformity. Right? And this is very distinct, that is, it's cafe ole spots, right? More than 10 cafe ole spots, we can suspect a condition called neurofibromatosis. Then there's a saddle gap. There's a gap between the first and the second toe. This is also a very specific feature, non, but this is isolated, non-specific. But if you take it in the syndromic context, this is quite specific can, uh, can be associated with Down syndrome. And the single pharma crease, which is uh, commonly associated with Down syndrome. 
And then I said, we get a lot of patients with ambiguous genitalia. So at birth, if there is a, a, a difficulty to determine the uh, sex of the baby, then we need to do a genetic, genetic testing, especially the karyotype needs to be done in these patients to determine the uh, sex of the baby. So these are some of the minor anomalies that are, are used in syndromic identification. I'm not going to go uh, into the details of each and every uh, anomaly because we are pressed for time. So uh, this uh, table will help us determine what are the different minor anomalies that we can uh, see in the patients. Right? So I think everybody can identify this condition. This is a very common condition. And as soon as you see this baby, you will think it is Down syndrome. Right? So our trisomy 21. So these babies will have... Uh, flat uh, occiput, they have uh, low ears, uh, and then they might have the single palm crease, widely spaced toes, and all the other uh, systemic anomalies as well. They usually have come with the congenital heart disease. They might have um, enlarged colon and uh, other problems. So we, if a child comes like this, we need to do a karyotype. And this is also to confirm and uh, to see how is the inheritance of this uh, anomaly or the uh, trisomy 21. Okay, this is also quite, common, quite commonly seen. This child, if you look at this child, you, have, you can see the widely uh, spaced nipples, then there's a webbed neck and wide carrying angle and short stature. Then if you look at the back of the head, you can see a low posterior hairline. So as soon as you, can, you see this child, we can actually think of a clinical diagnosis. And especially this child, children comes with primary amenorrhea, uh, we can think of Turner syndrome. Uh, and you can refer for genetic testing. What do you think this is? A child comes with hypotonia, poor suck or feeding problems, weak cry, and they're always hungry, very hungry. There's obesity, short stature, and thin tapering fingers. So in a condition like this, we have to suspect prada villi syndrome, right? So prada villi syndrome is caused by the loss of function of genes in a particular region in chromosome 15, this region. Okay. But to make a genetic diagnosis, it is not as straightforward as doing a karyotype because this condition can be inherited in three different ways. So one is the where the chromosome 15, this portion, the Prada Villa uh, segment is deleted. So this is about in 70% of the cases. Then there's another uh, way that they can inherit it where 25% of the cases, they inherit two copies of the maternal, uh, it, that portion of the chromosome. So this is called maternal uniparental disomy. Then rarely you can have translocation. So because of this, we have to do a test called DNA methylation analysis. So that is why genetic uh, referral and counseling is important because we have to do the proper test for the proper disease. This is another uh, condition that uh, you may encounter, which is achondroplasia, where there's a short stature child, large head, uh, and with the short arms and short legs. So if you do uh, x-ray, they will have a skeletal uh, uh, features such as uh, this, uh, the hip bone will have a, a square shaped, then uh, there's a narrow uh, sacrosatic notch, and this is a single gene disorder. So in this case, we will look at uh, for mutations in the FG, FR3 gene. So now uh, we can have different methods of genetic testing. So you have seen, we have, can do karyotype, we can do methylation studies, and now we have done a single gene testing to diagnose this type of condition, which is the achondroplasia. This is another condition. So with the, the, where there can be a very slim, tall, a child with uh, deformities in the uh, breastbone, which is here you can see pectus excavatum in the sternal area and the pesca, uh, pectus carinatum. Or you have, they can also have very long fingers where they are overriding here. Okay, so in a child like this, you have to suspect 
Marfan syndrome. So they are very tall, slenderly built, and they have disproportionately long arms and legs and fingers. Then, as you saw, there can be a sternal area, the chest area can have deformities. They will also have high arch palate, and they have cardiac and uh, even ophthalmological deformities. Right. So in this case, we will usually perform something called whole exome sequencing where we look at all the protein coding regions of the genome. And uh, in cases of Marfan syndrome, we can identify mutations in the FBN1 uh, gene. So uh, moving on to rare manifestations. So this is one of our uh, case reports. This was a very rare manifestation where you can see only four fingers. Right. So this also was diagnosed uh, using a whole exome sequencing where we identified a mutation in the uh, family and the parents were consanguineous. So this is why the family history is very important because if it is a homozygous variant that we find, then the parents can be heterozygous carriers. So uh, we reported this and the, uh, the the novelty of this is the mutation was also novel and we also found a new clinical phenotype. So that is why genetic testing is important because we not only diagnose but we can also identify new things that are not reported elsewhere. So when we do uh, genetic testing, I said there are several methods. So one is the karyotype, one is FISH, which is uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization. Then there is another uh, method, which is DNA microarray. And uh, for genetic, for single gene uh, mutations or monogenic diseases, the commonly used method now is the whole exome sequencing. Uh, so whole exome sequencing, if we can't find uh, any variants, we can go into whole genome sequencing as well. Then uh, there is another method called MLPA, which also all this genetic testing can be uh, complemented with biochemical testing. So to uh, summarize and conclude, uh, the approach to diagnosis of a syndromic baby is similar to making a diagnosis in anywhere else in medicine. So it needs a very methodical approach, beginning with the history, emphasis with uh, family history, and three, at least a three-generation family uh, pedigree uh, chart. Then examination of the antenatal uh, maternal investigations, such as anomalies, also anomaly scans, are very important. And the knowledge of common clinical signs and dysmorphic features will help you to make an initial diagnosis. This is a very important window for you to make a genetic diagnosis so the patient can be followed up and given the appropriate treatment. And we also saw what are the types of uh, different methods that we can employ to come to a genetic confirmation. So I will leave you with a case scenario. This is a picture test. I think you all can identify which condition this is. Uh, so with this, I will conclude my presentation.